Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Noelle O'Connell and I'm the CEO of European Movement Ireland. I'm delighted to see so many of you logging on this morning for the next in European Movement Ireland's In Conversation webinar series with our guest of honour this morning, Deputy Governor of the Central Bank of Ireland, Sharon Donnery. Today's event is the 14th in our Future of Europe in Conversation webinars. Uh, in the world before COVID, we were engaged in a series of Future of Europe engagements. In, 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 the, in the physical world, um, we've had to totally transition those online and we're delighted to have had over 13 uh, webinars since March. We've worked with a variety of partners such as the European Commission and the European Parliament and ourselves and over 5,000 of you have followed and engaged and watched the events online. So thank you for that. Uh, before we begin today's proceedings, I'd like to offer a few words about European Movement Ireland. We are celebrating our 66th birthday this year, and we are Ireland's longest established not-for-profit voluntary membership organization dedicated exclusively to Irish European affairs. And ultimately, our aim is to increase awareness and understanding of Ireland and Europe and that relationship. We work to achieve this through publications, programs, events, campaigns, and a variety of engagements. And indeed, only last week, um, as we announced at our AGM, COVID restrictions permitting, we look forward to presenting in either the physical or the virtual world, hopefully the former, our European of the Year Award to this year's very worthy awardee, Michel Barnier. We have a long and distinguished track record of developing the connections between Ireland and Europe. And the support and engagement of our members has been key to that and an increasingly polarized, uh, geopolitically challenged world, and one where disinformation, misinformation, and forces such as populism, and indeed, as we look down the track of, of, of Brexit, um, European Movement Ireland could not serve the purpose, the role, and the mission, and the work that we do without the support and engagement of you, our members. And in these COVID challenging times, that support in all its guises is really crucial so we are very grateful and appreciate and value your ongoing support and engagement. If you're not already a member, we'd really encourage you to join us and get involved and have your say and work to shape and influence Ireland's relationship with Europe. It's very important as we reflect on the economic circumstances of the EU, the Eurozone, and particularly in terms of COVID-19, but generally as well. When we discuss Europe's financial system, we are indeed discussing Europe's social system. Um, in terms of Eurozone reform, a, a topic that I'm, I've no doubt Sharon will speak about today, divisions between member states exist in multiple areas, from the introduction of a form of common fiscal policy to the implementation of a sovereign debt restructuring mechanism. But we have a, we have a, a huge range of of topics to, to, be, to be discussing here this morning. Um, and in terms of today's conference, it's particularly timely, and I'm very grateful to Deputy Governor uh, Donnery for her time as we look at that issue of Irish engagement and integration of Europe as seen from a central bank perspective. Where does European economic sovereignty for Ireland, for the Eurozone and the EU fall into this? In January this year, the European Commission announced its intention to adopt an overarching strategy for strengthening the EU's economic and financial sovereignty falling under the fourth priority of the Commission's work programme, a stronger Europe in the world. Indeed, European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen stated that the EU has to be more strategic, more assertive and more united in its approach to external matters, as we saw recently in her State of the Union address. And from an EU perspective, economic sovereignty is seen as the collective capacity of member states working together to maintain their economic and financial independence and a concept that underpins the entire European integration process. Today, though, we live in a world where the concepts of uh, economic sovereignty and how we work to ensure economic policy and foreign policy engagement are intertwined more than ever. And as we reflect on the effects of the global COVID pandemic, we are faced with Eurozone reform being dependent on consensus and compromise, which is often difficult to obtain, but crucial for the development of the Eurozone and Europe's economic stability. 
And of course, from an Irish perspective, we must consider Brexit with some breaking developments as we saw just in, in, the, in the hour before we went live this morning. Discussing all of the above and much more and charting Ireland's EU integration through the lens of our central bank here in Ireland. I'm delighted to be joined today at this really timely and informative In Conversation webinar with our guest of honour, Sharon Donnery. Sharon was appointed Deputy Governor of the Central Bank in March 2016, and she has considerable and vast experience at an EU level. Sharon is an ex officio member of the Central Bank Commission, and she's the Governor's alternate on the Governing Council of the European Central Bank. She is also Chair of the ECB Budget Committee, was previously a member of the European Systemic Risk Board and alternate member of the Supervisory Board of the Single Supervisory Mechanism. I'm trying to get my head around all those acronyms, Sharon. <laughs> she has chaired a number of European committees, including being chair of the ECB High Level Group on Non-Performing Loans, chair of the European Banking Authority's Consumer Protection Group, and vice chair of the EBA Standing Committee on Consumer Protection and Financial Innovation holding a BA in Economics and Politics and an MA in Economics from University College Dublin. And if all that wasn't impressive enough or enough work to, to be getting on with, earlier this year, she was appointed as an adjunct professor of economics in Trinity College Dublin. And I'm delighted, Sharon, you're, you're joining us this morning. And it is my pleasure to hand over to your good self. Thank you. Well, thanks very much uh, for the kind words of introduction, uh, Noel, and thanks to European Movement Ireland, of course, for having me this morning. Uh, and good morning uh, to everybody. It's a real pleasure to be here. I think maybe touching on some of what Noel said there, notwithstanding that we can only get together virtually, uh, given the uh, tremendous challenges we face at the moment and the many issues uh, that are important that we discuss, I think it's more important than ever uh, that we have these fora uh, where we can come together uh, and hear each other's views and perspectives. So uh, I really am delighted to, uh, to be here. Um, Noel mentioned uh, some of my experience there in the veritable alphabet soup of acronyms and so on. And uh, I'm afraid you'll hear a little bit more of that in my remarks this morning. Uh, so I hope people uh, will uh, bear with me uh, while I do that. And I look forward to the, the questions and uh, discussions that we have uh, later on. So thinking back, the decision by the vast majority of the Irish people to join the European communities into 1973 had a profound impact on our development as a nation. We looked outwards rather than inwards, recognising, as the then Taoiseach Sean Lemass had said during the accession negotiations, Ireland belongs to Europe by history, tradition and sentiment, and no less than by geography. Europe has played a substantial role in the transformation of Ireland from a protectionist nation to an international hub. Now, when preparing for today, I looked back at the white paper laid before the Houses of the Iraqis in 1970, outlining the implications of joining the then EC for Ireland. And along with the desire to participate in the movement towards European unity, the rationale included the belief that membership would be more beneficial for economic development than remaining outside the community. There was a recognition that the small domestic Irish economy alone would not enable our country to grow to achieve its principal economic objectives of full employment, the cessation of involuntary emigration, and a standard of living comparable with that of other Western European countries. Now, the European Union itself is also very different to the one that we joined over 40 years ago, from the implementation of the four freedoms governing the movement of goods and people, services and capital, to the creation of the common currency. And just as Ireland has benefited from progress, as a country, we've also worked really hard to contribute to that progress through our engagement. Of course, its evolution has not been without challenges. The financial and sovereign debt crisis left deep scars and exposed the vulnerabilities and costs of a partial and incomplete union. A key lesson, I think, for our resilience was the need for deeper integration. And this has led to a move to complete Europe's economic and monetary union. The aim of the reforms was to ensure that Europe delivered on its founding rationale and provided balanced economic growth and price stability, a competitive social market economy aiming at full employment and social progress. So it's critical that we deepen integration in Europe, that we complete this union, and we don't end up in a halfway house. So a monetary union, for example, needs a banking union. 
Now, today we face another crisis. And over the last six months, I think we've seen the European project deliver. Fiscal, monetary and financial sector policies were deployed when we faced this common challenge. But while the financial system withstood the initial effects of the pandemic, and we are now seeing a gradual economic recovery, the resilience of the financial system, and indeed Europe's resilience, may be tested further. So if we turn to the next slide, today I'm going to focus on the European-wide macroeconomic stabilisation policies that were deployed in response to the pandemic. Second, I'll turn to some common financial stability concerns. Third, I'll just briefly consider the departure of our nearest neighbour from the EU, which Noel also mentioned. And finally, I'll conclude with some thoughts on how we can be influential in Europe, particularly from the perspective of the central bank. So turning to macroeconomic stabilisation on the next slide, I think it's been key to mitigating the effects of the current crisis on individuals, on households and on firms. Now, by macroeconomic stabilisation, I mean the actions that policymakers take to counter the effects of economic shocks. For Ireland, as a small open economy on the periphery of Europe, particularly vulnerable to global shocks, being part of the single market has been critical to our growth and our prosperity in recent decades. And our resilience to shocks would likely have been weaker absent the common market, the common currency and the policy actions of Europe behind us. The policies and decisions we make engaging with our colleagues at the various tables in Europe are central to this. And following the harsh lessons of the last crisis, the European response to the pandemic has been both sizable and significant. In contrast to the last crisis, for example, counter-cyclical fiscal policy has played a huge role in supporting households and firms through the pandemic. At an EU level, the general escape clause of the Stability and Growth Pact, the fiscal framework was activated. And this enables countries to borrow heavily to finance the rising costs of the pandemic. The activation decision was made by the ECOFIN Council, made up of the economics and finance ministries of all member states. And as a small economy, I think our engagement at these four is especially important so that policies can help all member states overcome the crisis. The recent agreement on the next generation EU fund, which should help support all countries in their recovery from the current crisis, was also a considerable milestone. The agreement provides a common budgetary instrument to complement national fiscal policy. And while the fund is currently temporary, I think it should provide useful lessons for how a shared fiscal capacity can be used for macroeconomic stabilisation. On the monetary policy front, the Governing Council of the ECB responded rapidly with sizable measures, including the Pandemic Emergency Purchase Programme and the so-called Pandemic Emergency Long-Term Refinancing Operations. The envelope of PEP, as people are aware, is worth over a trillion euros worth of assets or approximately 11% of euro area gross domestic product which can be purchased on secondary markets under the programme until the end of June next year. Furthermore, additional monetary policy accommodation was also provided through an increase in our existing asset purchase programmes. Now, the goal of all these measures is to support the flow of credit to the real economy, to prevent a damaging tightening of financing conditions and to proactively respond to what is a worsening outlook for growth and inflation in the euro area. Furthermore, monetary policy has learned lessons from the euro crisis. Philip Lane, member of the executive board and my former colleague here as governor of the central bank, highlighted in a recent blog that flexibility embedded in the PEP has reduced the risk of fragmentation, which was a key issue in the euro crisis by front loading asset purchases and targeting them to where they were most warranted. So turning to the next slide, these significant actions of governments and of central banks have been critical in stabilising our economies. These counter-cyclical policies, both domestic and international, fiscal and monetary, are positively reinforcing each other across our borders and supporting the recovery. They're examples of the European project delivering a better outcome for all. Initial estimates suggest that for Ireland, compared to a scenario without policy action, these uh, measures would reduce the scale of the decline in output in 2020 by just over four percentage points. Now, there have been and always will be economic downturns, but deeper integration with the common aim of minimising hardship for households and firms should lead to better outcomes for the people of Europe. And our engagement in Europe is central to delivering this for the people of Ireland. Turning now to financial stability, which is a, an area of shared concern on the next slide. 
It's a core aspect of our mandate at the Central Bank of Ireland and an area where cooperation and integration with our European and our international partners is crucial. The financial system is interconnected, international and interdependent. And it's only by engaging and working together across borders that policymakers can ensure it remains stable, but also that it absorbs rather than amplifies shocks. And so it operates in the best interests of consumers and the wider economy. As Europe has changed over recent decades, so too has the financial system, notably with a larger share now operating outside the traditional banking system. So following the financial crisis, for me, the overarching lesson is that we do not want to find ourselves in some suboptimal halfway house. So turning to the next slide, one of the key initial responses to the last crisis was to introduce the European system of financial supervision, the so-called ESFS. And its main task is to ensure consistent and appropriate financial supervision throughout the EU. As the European Commission outlined in 2009, the system of solely national supervision lagged behind the interconnected and integrated reality of European financial markets, which operate across borders. So the ESFS consists of a collaborative network centred around the three European supervisory authorities, the European Banking Authority, the European Insurance and Occupational Pensions Authority, the European Securities and Markets Authority, and the European Systemic Risk Board, as well as us, the national supervisors. So in the next slide, we can see that from these beginnings, later steps were taken to implement the banking union, which is particularly important in a monetary union as problems in other countries can quickly spill across borders. And while we have made progress towards a functioning banking union with the introduction of cross-border banking supervision, for example, through the single supervisory mechanism, as well as rules for managing failing banks through the single resolution mechanism, it is not yet complete. A key outstanding issue includes the lack of a common system for deposit protection. And I think this is really important as within the euro area, depositors in a country hit by a crisis may worry that they are not protected to the same extent as depositors in other member states, incentivizing them to move their funds abroad. And this, of course, could amplify shocks to our economy and our banking systems. So to this backdrop and on the back of the resilience that we have built up in recent years, the banking system has been able to support the economy in this first phase of the pandemic. But I think it's fair to say that the shock has not yet fully transmitted fully to the balance sheet of the banks. However, as we transition from temporary forbearance measures that have addressed liquidity for borrowers, there is a need for longer term solutions for those borrowers who continue to experience solvency and affordability difficulties. And of course, we are seeing that some sectors are much more affected than others, for example, hospitality and accommodation, where economic disruption is affecting the employment and viability of those businesses. The inevitable effects of unemployment and business closures will take time to materialise through to bank balance sheets. Of course, the European institutions have played an important role here too. So the European Banking Authority, for example, facilitated the delivery of payment breaks, and they did this through guidelines providing regulatory flexibility so that lenders could offer temporary relief to borrowers in the form of payment moratoria that suspend regulatory rules on loan classifications. While the extent of the effects on the financial system will, of course, depend on the evolution of the virus and the scarring effects of the crisis, the deeper European regulatory and supervisory integration that we've achieved has created a more robust and resilient system to withstand the initial shock. Now, the banking system is just one element of the financial system. And if we turn to the next slide, we can see that following the financial crisis, an increasing share of financial intermediation has moved to parts of the non-bank or so-called market-based finance system. So to give a sense of its scale, non-bank financial institutions now account for almost 60% of total euro area financial assets. And the equivalent number in the early years of the euro, for example, was just under 40%. The scale of the sector in Ireland is also relevant to the global picture, as our jurisdiction holds 10% of global money market funds and 5% of global investment fund assets, excluding those money market funds. And there are a range of diverse business models domiciled here, including investment funds, securitisation vehicles and non-securitisation vehicles. And the sector in Ireland is dominated by investment funds, including those MMFs, which I mentioned a moment ago. So you can see on the next slide that, of course, market-based finance does provide a valuable alternative to bank financing, and it can facilitate risk sharing across the financial system. 
So recognising this, the European Commission has produced its action plan to complete capital markets union in Europe. Deeper and more developed capital markets can facilitate long-term investment by allowing businesses to access a wider range of funding sources. And savers and investors can also benefit from greater choice. Developing CMU can also become another instance of how we are stronger together. It will also help, as Executive Board Member Isabel Schnappel emphasised recently, to accelerate the transition towards a carbon neutral economy as the evidence suggests that stock markets are more effective than banks in financing the greening of our economy. However, like all forms of financial intermediation, market-based finance can also contribute to the build-up of financial vulnerabilities. And the vulnerabilities that are linked to market-based finance include those which are related to liquidity mismatches and excessive leverage. Now, given the size of the sector that's domiciled here in Ireland, we actively contribute to discussions on these issues through our role in the euro system, through the European system of financial supervision, as well as being active at the global level through contributions to deliberations at IOSCO and the Financial Stability Board. Now, in the next slide, we can see that the shock from COVID-19, sorry, actually, it's the next one. I think I missed one there. Apologies for that. The shock from COVID-19 resulted in stress across the global financial markets. Parts of the global fund sector, including funds resident in Ireland, experienced a sharp increase in redemptions and challenges in liquidity management. Our most recent financial stability review, which was published in June, showed that there was around 72 billion in net redemptions from Irish resident funds in March. And at an ind individual level, of course, the vast majority of funds did manage to meet investor redemption requests with limited use of tools such as suspension and gating observed. However, this also needs to be seen, I think, in the context of unprecedented central bank interventions, which played a key role in restoring market functioning. And the focus is now on the extent to which structural vulnerabilities from liquidity mismatches and leverages in the global fund sector contributed to that market disruption. As regulators, we must ensure that the level of resilience in the market-based finance sector is great enough to match its increased importance in the financial system and the broader economy. So the central bank is actively engaged with international stakeholders on identifying risks in the sector, as well as making the case for and contributing to the development of a macro prudential framework for this sector. And as we work towards CMU in Europe the enhance, to enhance risk sharing in parallel, I think we must also develop the resilience of the non-bank sector. So as I've outlined, Ireland in Europe and the deeper integration of Europe is critical for macroeconomic stabilization and the financial stability challenges that we face. So turning to the next slide, though, these are not the only challenges. Absent COVID-19, my remarks today may have focused on the departure of our nearest neighbour from the EU. Since joining the EU, our economic profile has changed remarkably. Where once our trade was largely centred around the UK, today the EU bloc is our largest trading partner. The composition of our economy, and so too our exports, has transformed, with a smaller role for agriculture, a rise in pharma, medtech and ICT exports, and substantial growth in the financial services sector. Now, this latter growth, of course, is particularly important for us in the Central Bank of Ireland for the regulation and supervision of the financial services firms that now populate the International Financial Services Centre in Dublin, for example. But since the 2016 referendum, the Central Bank has worked on identifying and understanding the financial stability and consumer protection risks which arise. And together with other policymakers, we've worked so that potential financial stability cliff edge risks are mitigated to the greatest extent possible following the expiry of the transition period. Nonetheless, whatever the outcome of the negotiations, our economic analysis shows that the outcome for Ireland will be worse than the status quo and will cause significant disruption. And the considerable uncertainty, disruption and differing sectoral effects due to COVID-19 will add to the stresses faced by firms as the transition period ends. Now, we'll publish our fourth quarterly bulletin of the year next week, where we will consider some of these issues in much more detail. Of course, beyond the economic effects, we're also losing a colleague at many of the European tables and committees we participate in. And going forward, we must strengthen our engagement with our European peers so that we may influence and shape key decisions and policies in Europe and internationally. So today I've considered the macroeconomic stabilisation response to the pandemic, our financial stability concerned, concerns and considered the challenges ahead as our nearest neighbour leaves the union. 
So turning to the next slide, I think critical to these issues also is our ongoing engagement and integration in Europe. From the governor's seat at the ECB when deciding on monetary policy, to decisions at the EBA on supervisory forbearance and discussions with the European supervisory bodies when the investment sector saw large redemptions in March. From the central bank's perspective, external engagement, particularly with our colleagues across Europe, will continue to be a key focus for the central bank in the future. Engaging and influence is one of our five strategic themes. And within this, we endeavor to actively contribute to decision-making and to engage strategically with the Eurosystem, the single supervisory mechanism, the European supervisory authorities, the European Systemic Risk Board and the Single Resolution Board. And this work ranges from major strategic issues, such as the ongoing monetary policy review, to more operational issues, such as regular data collection, and of course, everything in between. That our participation with these organisations is such a core part of what we do, I think reflects our deep integration with Europe. Now, finally, let me conclude with a reflection. Regardless of our integration in Europe, we would have faced many of the same challenges and issues, including macroeconomic stabilisation and financial stability, as well as many issues that I haven't even touched on today, such as climate change, stable coins and cryptocurrencies, and ageing populations. Responding to these global challenges as a small economy or as a central bank without the weight of Europe would be considerably harder. Instead, our engagement in Europe and the deeper integration of Europe offers us a path to prosperity based on balanced economic growth and price stability, a competitive social market economy aiming at full employment and social progress. Thanks very much uh, for your attention and I look forward uh, to the discussion. Uh, thanks again, Noel. Thank you, Sharon, for that really comprehensive and and wide ranging um, address. I I think you've managed to 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 cover <laughs> the the huge range of gambit and responsibilities that you you and your colleagues are currently uh, charged with overseeing and and regulating, but also ensuring. I think something that that really struck me is that I suppose Ireland we we think of it as sometimes that of 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 what's being done to us, but the, we are part of it. Um, it's our monetary policy. We have a say and we have a seat at the table. Would that be something that you would you would agree with, Sharon? Very much so. Um, and I, I think as I do agree with you that sometimes in commentary, this is seen as something that happens uh, to us. Uh, but I think certainly from our perspective at the central bank, and I know this is sh shared more widely across uh, the public service and even organisations like your own, um, I think we really have to see it as being part of the overarching system. I think even, uh, you know, a sort of personal reflection I would have on that is my own career at the central bank. I won't go into how long that is, uh, but it's probably been one of the main shifts I've seen. You know, when I started in the bank, uh, which was just prior to the introduction of the euro, uh, you know, much more happened, I think, at a domestic level. But regardless of where you look across the central bank's mandate now, I mean, some of the issues I touched on today, but many, many other issues that we work on in terms of consumer and investor protection, uh, for example, uh, you know, the minutia of regulation and so on, for the financial services system. Uh, so much more of that uh, is determined um, at European level. And I think it emphasises the importance of this uh, strategic engagement, not just for us, uh, but for other organisations as well in terms of understanding that. And then to your point about the seat at the table, uh, I mean, it is a really important uh, role. We do have a say in the decision making. Um, and for example, at the European Central Bank at the Governing Council, you know, Ireland is one seat at the table, the same as every other seat at the table. And, and I think it is important to reflect on that. Absolutely, Sharon, and I think that's something that sometimes we we forget about or we we lose sight of, and and uh, really important that you remind us uh, of that. And 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 I suppose I, and thank you to all um, of our our viewers and our followers. Um, some great questions coming in. We'd we'd encourage people if there are any questions you want to ask the deputy governor of the Central Bank of Ireland. Now is your chance. We we have Sharon for the next uh, half hour or so. So please do continue to get your your questions in. Um. Sharon, one thing that, that we try to do here in European Movement Ireland, and I know it's something that you and your colleagues in the Central Bank are very supportive of, is promoting and encouraging, uh, I suppose, if I can put it this way quite bluntly, that Irish pipeline 
at all levels of European Union institutions. So, for example, as we have seen, our Minister for Finance, uh, Pascal Donoghue, as, as president of the of the Eurogroup, and uh, tomorrow, um, Mairead McGuinness has her has her commissioner hearing um, with with uh, with her um, hopefully appointment to the portfolio of CMU Financial Services, and that's something that you 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 and your colleagues will be hugely engaged and involved with. I'm, I have no doubt. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think, as you say, uh, these roles are obviously very important. I mean, it is important to emphasize that when people are in uh, those roles, uh, that they are taking European perspective. And of course, we all know that. But I think as, as we were talking about a moment ago, it, you know, if we truly see ourselves as part of the system and part of a, a collective, uh, then we, we have a responsibility as well as an interest, I think, um, in being involved in the discussions um, and in having key roles in the organisations and agencies and so on that, that um, uh, you know, are leading these decisions and leading the work. And of course, I mean, one of the great strengths of Europe is its diversity. Um, and it's important, I think, for also for European cohesion that it has that diversity of perspectives, experiences and so on from all of the different member states, big, small and the different histories and experiences that we have and so on. Um, and I think people going into those roles and um, obviously uh, bring that diversity and, the, and that experience so that of course you know Europe remains grounded I suppose in what we are which is you know the collection of the member states and the people that we, we represent and maybe a further reflection on that I think as well uh, something that has also changed uh, you know or evolved somewhat at the Central Bank of Ireland and I think has become more a feature of what you talk about there of the engagement at all levels um, is the need also for public engagement by the organisations, but also then for society and the public to sort of engage back with the organisations. Uh, so we have the monetary policy strategy review at the moment, for example. You know, President Lagarde has talked numerous times about the important role of citizens in that and of listening to our, our citizens. Uh, so I think that engagement goes not just from that very high level of Ireland having these roles and opportunities and responsibilities, uh, but also the way that society engages and the way also that institutions listen back uh, to people in the member states uh, because after all you know that collective good um, of the citizens is, is what we're here uh, to serve. And that's really welcome and important to, to hear you Sharon say that particularly in your role and your position. Um, what what uh, initiatives and efforts are you and your colleagues doing to, to, to further that engagement uh, if I can put it I suppose from a domestic perspective? So I think we, I mean, we have a long history in the central bank of things like uh, public consultations, for example, when we'd be embarking um, on new policy or new regulation and so on. Uh, again, I mean, reflecting what we've been discussing, some of that also now happens at European level, where, for example, the European Commission or the ECB uh, would be running big public consultations as well. I think from our point of view here, though, uh, we have tried... Uh, to think about our communications much more, not just about us communicating our messages outwards, but how do we listen uh, back from uh, societies, representative groups. Uh, we have regular civil society engagement, uh, for example, um, much more engagement with uh, sort of small firms and so on. And I think, um, as we were talking about at the very beginning, the challenges that we have now in terms of just being able to meet and get together mean that we have to pay even more attention uh, to how we reach out, how we listen, how we take uh, on board uh, feedback from people and how I suppose we really understand what's happening on the ground and in the real economy uh, rather than just what we maybe see in the in the data and so on that we're collecting um, and analysing. So we've certainly been doing, I think, much more of that over recent years and particularly so in the context of the pandemic. Of course. Uh, like like us all, I think Sharon, it's the it's the new normal, isn't it? The, yeah, the, the, that, that we're operating in at the moment. Um, you you briefly mentioned in your uh, in your speech. Obviously, time constraints um, got the better for with us uh, for for some of the topics. But um, something that you mentioned in terms of it being a priority for the ECB and obviously for the Commission um, and and the member states as well is this greater transition towards uh, the green and digital technologies, and how. How would you see this, Sharon, having influenced policy at, a, at an ECB level more broadly? And how does that then in turn impact the work that you and your colleagues are doing? Yeah, so I think it's obviously very high um, on the agenda uh, for the Commission. It's very high on the agenda of, of governments in the member states as well. I think from a central banking perspective, there's been quite a change over the last number of years in terms of our sort of level of interest in and engagement uh, in this issue. 
Uh, there's now a sort of global network of central banks uh, called the Network for the Greening of the Financial System, which is trying to bring together, uh, you know, central bank policymakers from all across the globe. So even more uh, broadly uh, than Europe um, in looking at some of these issues and I suppose what the right roles for central banks is in, in that debate. And of course, there is a debate about that. I mean, there are some people, I think, who would be of the view um, that, you know, major policies that have distributional effects, for example, are matters uh, for government and central banks uh, should stick more closely uh, to their mandates. There are others, of course, that would see this as a sort of major issue for the globe and for society. And therefore, all agencies, including central banks, uh, need to play a role in it. And um, so, uh, you know, that debate continues. But I think for us, um, some of our main priorities here um, are around, obviously, the financial system and how the financial system deals with some of those issues. There's been good progress on the taxonomy, for example, at European level, which I think will help with that. Uh, you know, there's been further development around, uh, you know, lending practices and so on in terms of firms lending uh, to support uh, the green transition. Uh, but clearly, you know, much work ahead, including um, in thinking about some of the issues as part of uh, the monetary policy role for the ECB and what's the right role there in the context of monetary policy. All right. And you mentioned uh, you mentioned in your in in your presentation, and I think one or two questions have have come in from from the the uh, from the audience just in relation to this. Um, in addition, as if, as if it wasn't uh, uh, as if there wasn't enough uh, with the challenges of COVID nineteen, but that you um, the ECB and your European Central Bank colleagues um, have had to factor in preparations for Brexit and the economic consequences that that's undoubtedly going to cause uh, at, all, at all levels. And I think you mentioned that um, the, the bank is going to be publishing a report on it shortly. To what extent do you, so I'm going to get two, two I'm, going to, I'm going to do two for the price of one if I can. Uh, to, what, to what extent do you, do you do you, from from your expert insight and, and seat at the table, so to speak, do you consider the ECB's level of preparedness for Brexit? And then also equally, how do you view Ireland's uh, preparedness for Brexit from 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 where you're you're currently seated? Um, yeah, so I suppose I'd make a distinction between um, two different aspects, one of which I suppose is closer to our mandate and therefore we've more direct control over. Um, so, you know, if you think about the work that we had to do uh, around Brexit, you know, there was a large piece of work around understanding the economic effects. Um, and sort of, I suppose, helping the debate and informing the debate around the economic effects and how Ireland could best prepare for that. And I'll come back to that in a moment. And the other was more directly focused on the financial system. Uh, so understanding what were the risks to the financial system, how were firms preparing uh, for Brexit, um, and how were we as a central bank and as a system preparing. Um, and certainly with colleagues in the ECB and the other um, regulators and central banks around Europe, you know, there's been a huge amount of work done around the transition for firms, how they're going to operate in the future and, and so on, passporting and equivalents and, and all of these issues. Some, of course, of which remain open issues in the context of the negotiations, but in trying to prepare for those issues and significant amount of work around contingency planning. So, you know, what does it mean for customers of a firm? Um, have they been informed of the consequences? Do customers need to migrate, etc.? So a very, very significant amount of work um, around that. Um, also issues to do with clearing and so on, where there's been considerable, you know, public debate, I think, and concern about the, the financial stability risks, for example, that could arise from that. And I think in that piece of work and um, there's been a huge amount of progress made and I would say you know while there are things firms of course need to be thinking about and planning and preparing for uh, you know much of that work is done and I think we're in a relatively good space of course allowing for the fact that the future is still um, unknown but in parent, uh, I suppose in terms of preparing for immediate cliff edge issues. Um, in terms of the economic effects, um, I mean, clearly we did some work with the ECB on understanding that as well, Ireland being one of the, the most affected, if not the most affected uh, member state. In terms of our own work here at the Central Bank, and we'll publish more work on this next week, um, you know, that's been primarily focused, I think, particularly on the sectors that are going to be most affected. And um, one thing we've called out a number of times and we look at again next week is the issues, not just of tariffs, which people are obviously very focused on, but also non-tariff uh, barriers, you know, paperwork and customs checking and also some of the challenges around the land bridge. Um, and I think, again, the considerable level of uncertainty that remains 
means that there are still big issues there that firms that are in those sectors and so on um, need to be thinking about. Now, in the central bank, we don't have, I suppose, the direct interaction with those uh, firms in the economy and so on because we're not supervising them and so on. Uh, but, you know, from what we're discussing with others, um, it's important, I think, that those firms are thinking about those issues, you know, supply chains and how things are really going to operate. And, of course, I can understand a huge level of frustration um, around the uncertainty and, and you know I still hear people saying but we don't know what's going to happen we don't know how it's going to work etc and, and I accept all of that and I suppose from our point in the uh, view in the central bank uh, we really have to be in a situation now I think where you know it's prepared for the worst and um, given the uncertainty levels uh, that are there and people need to be thinking about that so I'm sorry to be sort of uh, pessimistic about it yeah. but I think given the short deadlines um, and so on uh, you know people have to be thinking um, along those lines and maybe you know reorienting their business and supply chains and so on and of course in the context of the pandemic I can understand that that's even more challenging than before. How high up your your risk matrix would that be Sharon um the, the cliff edge possibly that you spoke about from a central bank perspective if that's if that's not too harsh a question to ask yeah so I think in terms of the potential economic effects for Ireland uh, particularly to do with these issues to do with the import and export of goods I mean it would be very high on the list uh, along with the, the pandemic in terms of the economic consequences as I said in terms of the financial system consequences and um, I think um, not to be complacent about it of course you know firms still have uh, responsibility to do things that need to be done and so on and there are things uh, that you know will still need to be worked out and uh, and so on and um, but uh, you know I suppose it's a relatively known set of issues um, and we have clearer visibility and probably a bit more sight over them. Um, and I mean, that reflects a lot of work by us, but also by the firms uh, who have been involved also in an uncertain environment. You know? For sure. Absolutely. Um, a, a, a great question has come in from Martina Fitzgerald, and I'm just going to 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 quote it to make sure I, I get it right, Sharon. OK, so Martina saying um, you have chaired Sharon, the ECB high level group on non performing loans and also the European Banking Authority's Consumer Protection Group. How concerned should regulators be in terms of non performing loans and increasing debt in terms of consumers, businesses, financial institutions and governments across the EU during the pandemic? Um, so, I mean, I think I have to reflect that, of course, this is a major uh, issue for us and a huge part of our, our work right now. Um, I think at both European level and domestically here in Ireland, um, significant progress had been made um, in dealing with the non-performing loan issues that arose uh, from the previous crisis, um, you know, partly through the work that was done on, on the group I met, uh, you mentioned there that I chaired, but also a whole range of other things, including, for example, you know, in Ireland, the reform of the bankruptcy legislation and so on, which was also mirrored um, in, in many other countries. Um, I do think one um, important aspect that emerged from the last financial crisis uh, was a much stronger focus on what we call in Ireland, you know, the mortgage rules or the macro prudential tools uh, that regulators have. And again, many other uh, countries around Europe have those now. Um, and it has meant that in terms of the evolution of credit over the last uh, number of years, um, you know, there has been more constraint on that in terms of, uh, you know, not having this really high risk lending that we had uh, going into the previous crisis. So that has been very important. And um, capital buffers in the banks was also built up considerably over the last number of years. And um, again, with the idea of sort of having a resilience in the system to prepare for a future downturn. So we do have uh, progress in terms of the level of non-performing loans, having a strong macro prudential framework, uh, which I suppose has mitigated some of the risks around high risk lending and also the banks having more significant uh, capital buffers. But that's the sort of starting point for now. I mean, clearly into the future, it's uncertain, uh, but I think we have to expect uh, that households and businesses uh, will to some extent have long term scarring effects from this and will have challenges around um, indebtedness. Um, and there will be the emergence of, of non performing loans into the future. Um, I think the payment breaks that were put in place in many countries, and there were some differences in how countries went about it, but they were an important tool for a sort of immediate response to the challenges um, that were presented. Uh, but the transition now to sort of longer term, um, more structural arrangements that actually take into account the individual circumstances of households and firms is really, really important. That will be the focus uh, for the next few months. Um, and I think it's really important that we try to avoid some of the mistakes of the past. The, some of my colleagues have, have published work on this this week, uh, earlier this week. But 
you know, in Ireland, uh, you know, part of the response to the last crisis uh, was sort of repeated short term arrangements, what we used to call in the Central Bank of Ireland, extend and pretend. And I think we really have to enjoy that. We have to have banks engage with um, in a sort of proactive and constructive way with borrowers, whether they're households or firms, um, look at the issues on the table and come up with restructuring arrangements that are going to be sustainable into the future, as opposed to sort of, you know, repeated uh, short term uh, arrangements. And certainly in terms of our work here, the work at the ECB banking supervision and so on will be very focused on engaging with banks um, around those issues. And actually, on that point, Sharon, you just touched upon it there. Some some of the lessons uh, lessons learned from the the last crisis. How would you see your your role and and that of the central bank to to uh, take on board? What what lessons would would you as 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 the regulator and as the institution have have taken from the last financial crisis? And how are you using that to adapt and evolve? To what is, and I'm sorry, I think it might be the first time saying it, using this word this morning, but this unprecedented uh, global pandemic. H how is the central bank adapting and and uh, uh, taking on board the lessons it would have learned previously to to make sure that it's able to to try and mitigate and uh, the worst impacts of, of the COVID pandemic from from the the macroeconomic perspective. Yeah, so I think if you look back to the last crisis, I mean, there were clearly many issues with regulatory failings and so on, um, not just here in Ireland, but globally as well. Uh, and many, many, although I would say not all, but many of those have been addressed in terms of the supervisory framework that we have now, the regulatory policies that we have in place now and so on. Um, I, I think in terms of uh, the sort of broader set of issues, and, and I touched on this to some extent in my remarks, the need for this really... Um, quick, timely, targeted uh, action. And I think for me that that has probably been one of the things that has been a little bit different uh, this time. Uh, there has been criticism in the past of the European response uh, to the last crisis, uh, you know, that in some respects it was slow, in some respects it was very focused on individual member states and not the sort of collective. Um, and I think, you know, notwithstanding that there were debates and so on about the, the uh, fiscal framework and the, the next generation EU fund and so on, which, you know, took a little bit of time um, and of course we have to acknowledge that but I think even notwithstanding that uh, the fact that those things have been agreed uh, the fact that I think we've seen a very swift uh, monetary policy response that has also been complemented by you know the regulatory framework to support things like payment breaks and so on I think that has been a real uh, positive and that sort of um rapid nature of the response, I think, has been something that has certainly been learned. I mean, a key thing, I think it arose in the last crisis, but it's obviously re very relevant for now as well, is that those responses need to be targeted as well. Yeah. Uh, and as time is going on now, and we're seeing and understanding, I suppose, more of the effects of the pandemic, particularly in terms of some of the sectoral effects in the economy and so on, I think we need to be really clear that the measures that we take are going to be targeted at sort of supporting those uh, sectors of the economy um, that need it most, uh, and also supporting adaptation I suppose mm -hmm. so I mean it's absolutely clear that we're going to be living with this for some time businesses households firms we are going to have to adapt and so to the extent that support is being provided and um, it needs to also be helping I think those firms um, adapt their business models and so on for this at least for now uh, new reality yeah absolutely well it looks like it's going to last uh, uh, unfortunately for for a bit longer than we might have thought in in march of this year but um you you mentioned it there it's actually one of the priorities for the current german program for the presidency of the eu and, and lessing um in terms of focusing on learning the lessons from from the pandemic and i think you 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 raised some of those 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 points there but a concern that many would have would be the potential, or would you see that there would be a potential uh, for a two-speed recovery having on the European Union uh, as a whole? So, by that, what I mean is some of the, uh, and we saw the, we saw the frugal four, the Corona, the Corona nine, and various other um, aspects of it. But you know, certain member states have really, really struggled during the the pandemic in terms of economic terms, but also from a public health perspective. Speaking specifically in terms of Spain and Italy. Would you be concerned that there was a potential for a two-speed recovery? Yeah, so I think this is possible, but I wouldn't just distinguish it as being an issue about um, individual member states, because actually what we're seeing is 
and um, quite heterogeneous effects also across sectors, for example. And in fact, the sectoral distinction is probably driving some of what's happening in member states because, of course, you know, individual co economies have different reliances on different sectors. And um, so we are definitely seeing uh, that sort of divergence uh, where the sector is most directly affected. I mean, and everybody knows what they are, aviation, tourism, hospitality, the more sort of uh, social uh, aspects of the economy, particularly services driven. And um, it's proving more and more challenging, whereas, you know, other parts of the economy have adapted much more quickly or have been less directly affected. Uh, so I think to the extent to which member states' economies reflect those sector differences um, is going to be an important aspect um, in thinking about you know, how the recovery ultimately plays out. Demographics has also been um, a key issue. I think in some of the health issues, uh, there's certainly been discussion that demographics have been some of the key issues in terms of the vulnerability of certain populations or those that have older populations. Uh, but <laughs> I think that's that has potential also for this kind of two speed issue, uh, depending on, you know, the workforce, the age profile of the workforce and so on, because we can also see um, that, you know, a lot of the effects are falling on uh, younger workers because they tend to be workers in particular sectors or workers with particular skill levels, uh, where some higher skill sectors, for example, are less affected. So I think in, in terms of thinking about the policy responses, you know, it's not simply an issue about which member state, it's an issue about the composition of their economies, the sectors that are there, the age profile of those uh, sectors, the, the composition of their workforce and so on, and trying to make sure that we understand how that's playing out and therefore how the policy choices that we make uh, deal with some of those challenges. So reskilling, for example, I think is going to be a major issue um, over the next few years, as an example. You know. Well, I, I, for one, can can uh, testify to having to rescale on all things Zoom and StreamYard, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> you're paying, yeah. yeah, absolutely, absolutely. We've all we've all had to take a master's crash course in 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 digital production, haven't we? Um, yeah. No, that no, that's fantastic, Sharon. And just my last and final question for you, um, if I may, it just struck me there as um, sadly that we're not we're not in the physical world. Where, where, where we were able to be uh, seated across from each other. But I think the last time we um, we would have been uh, we would have been in the same room was um, at the really impressive Women in Leadership event that you and your colleagues supported that we did with uh, Vice President of the Commission, Margaret Vestager, if you, if you remember. Yeah. Um, and just, it, it struck me because uh, you're a real champion and promoting women in leadership um, and all those aspects. If I may, how do you find um, your leadership style having to adapt and change in the new normal in the COVID pandemic? Is How, how have you been managing in terms of the remote working, I would imagine, or, or are, you, are you doing a hybrid situation in the central bank or, or how are you, how's that all going in terms of leading your, your teams uh, for, from your own perspective as a deputy governor? So I think the first thing to say is, uh, you know, I have to really compliment uh, the staff of the bank. And I think this is true of many organisations uh, because, you know, the way that they have um, stepped up, adapted, have focused on the importance of our role um, in supporting the economy and the country through this really difficult time, I think uh, really has to be commended. It's It's been extraordinary. Uh, but they, uh, like myself personally, and many others, I think, um, are certainly finding some aspects of the work environment very challenging. Um, we were very lucky, I think, also from a sort of IT point of view. Uh, you know, we had very strong resilience in our system to move very quickly to being able to work uh, remotely. And the vast majority of staff are working working remotely most of the time. Uh, so some of us are occasionally in the office, as I am, for example, today, but it is occasionally other than some really critical and essential staff. And certainly from where we sit here in North Hall Quay, uh, where we'd be talking to many of the other organisations around us, and um, that is also the case for, for many of those organisations. I think we also have to acknowledge that many people, our health uh, colleagues in the public service are on the front line, but many workers have also been working, you know, in supermarkets and on public transport and so on uh, throughout. So our experience has been a little bit different maybe to, to some others and, and we have to acknowledge that and um, it is a challenge though I think um, and maybe to the point we were discussing earlier for example around influencing and engaging
meeting. You know, a big part of what we had done in the bank previously was go to international meetings. Many of our staff spent a lot of time um, in international meetings, talking to people, meeting people, and the meetings and discussions on the margins of meetings as important as the meetings themselves. That is very challenging um, in this environment. Um, I know also it's challenging, you know, work-life balance when work and the office are in one room in the house. Um, also very, ch very challenging. Um, so, uh, I mean, like everybody else, uh, there are issues uh, that we have to adapt to. I think key for us in the bank has been trying to stay very focused on what we do in terms of our mandate, the importance of that for the public, the importance that we deliver on that. I mean, that will have real consequences for the outcomes um, in terms of the support that's provided uh, to the economy. It's a, it's a key motivator always in the bank uh, for our staff. Uh, and we're trying very much, I think, to, to leverage that in terms of our, our mandate and um, our public sector values. Fantastic. Well, well, words of words of uh, words of wisdom there, and uh, a big thank you to you and to to all your colleagues for for all the work uh, that that you're doing. I think for all of us and uh, and all organisations and businesses and companies, we've really had to dig deep and and find that inner resilience and and mm -hmm. strength to to uh, adapt to the new normal and upskill on all things technology. I think it's fair to say. So I'm um, very impressed uh, with your with your um, IT infrastructure being so strong and and embedded. And we from a European Movement Ireland side of things can verify that <laughs> there'll be no <laughs> firewall breaches. I'm telling you. <laughs> no. Well, listen, Sharon, thank you so much for that. I think we've touched upon a huge range of topics and issues and and uh, no other questions are coming in from uh, from from the audience. So in keeping with with uh, best practice tradition, as they say, they try to say keep keep the webinars to under an hour. And I see on our clock watch, we're coming up to 56 minutes. So I'm going to give both of us a gold star for that. Um, I just want to, if I could just thank you um, and your colleagues and 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 our very hardworking board member Valerie Hertzberg for all their support in bringing today's webinar to fruition and uh, a big thank you to my own team in European Movement Ireland as well. Um, it's been a really fascinating and engaging discussion and a big thank you to um, our virtual audience. Hopefully in the not too distant future we will be able to have uh, conversations and events such as these in, in the physical world. And uh, in the meantime, we have a series of uh, further webinars and events coming, coming down the track on the German presidency, on the Green Deal. And only this week, we uh, launched the latest episode of our Just the Chats podcast with uh, the Irish Times Europe correspondent, Naomi O'Leary. And we have a huge range of exciting podcast conversations uh, in store as well. So if you are not a member, I encourage you to get involved, to make sure to follow us across uh, the various social media platforms, and uh, also to, to do the same with the Central Bank and keep an eye on the really important work that Sharon and her colleagues are doing. So thank you very much. Thank you, Sharon, for your time. Really, really appreciate it. And in the meantime, ladies and gentlemen, I do hope you and yours are keeping well and safe. Slongafol. Thanks a lot again for having me. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Bye.